Uh, my name is Darren McKenney. Um, I'm the General Manager of the Miramar Aboriginal Language and Technology Centre. Uh, my heritage extends to the Gumaroi and Wiradjuri nations of Australia. As a visitor to your land, I would like to acknowledge your elders, your ancestors and all those who have gone before you. And I acknowledge all Native Americans in all of your diversity. And my laptop keeps scrolling off here still. <laughs> So as you can see, my topic's uh, titled Modern Ways for Ancient Words and uh, it's something which um, I'm looking for, uh, I'm always looking for is being able to connect our two worlds, our old world with this new world which we're now uh, living in. Hopefully I don't need a translator, I'll try my best. So first off, I would just like to um, set the scene for um, our language loss in our country, uh, some comments from, from some people, and um, yeah, I'll let them speak. So that video clip was made, those people that spoke are from the top right hand uh, part of Australia there on the coastal area, uh, a place called Queensland. Um, so to give you an idea about Australia, just a quick background uh, before I get into the things that I would like to, is, is that uh, um, that is how our island looks to us. Uh, we're a country of over 250 plus nations, um, of course 250 plus languages, identities and people. Um, we use the word Indigenous, we use the word Aboriginal to describe ourselves, but look, as you know, they're not our words. You know, Native American's not your word. You, know, you come from your country and you know what you call yourself. And as, as I do myself, I'm Gumroi Wiradjuri. With Today, how it sits, as you can see from down the bottom there, we've possibly got just 20 strong languages being spoken, conversation, each day. Just 20. The state which I come from, uh, New South Wales, which is on the east coast there, we have over 75 languages in our, in our, uh, in our area and uh, we've got maybe about three of those which could possibly uh, be in a situation of being able to be spoken or taught in schools today. You know, those languages are coming back. But in our state we have ourselves uh, no people having conversation on a daily basis. You know, we've had huge language loss. But as we know, our language is the core of our identity and... Um, We'll, we will be getting it back. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know if I'll ever be speaking my language, but we're going to be giving it a go. It may be too late for me, my children, I'm not sure, but we're working on it. So what I'd like to do is just sort of give you an idea about um, how I got to do and how I got to maybe come here as well. Um, I'll go back about eight years and, uh, and I, w I was actually working for a communications company back in Australia, the national one there, and I uh, um, had got to the end of... I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I was working for someone else and, I don't know, you've got shareholders, you've got dividends, you're getting hassled all the time to meet sales targets and things like this, so an opportunity arose where I could work in community. And uh, I took that opportunity up and... Um, uh, uh, um, it's where I've been since. In about 2003, 2004 it was, um, you know, we decided, you know, we were doing cultural and education talks on a, on a property back home. Um, Aboriginal education, uh, we were getting tours come in uh, from school children, university people and so forth to tour this property and we'd deliver 
some you know, cultural stories to them. Uh, we talk about the bush plants and all this type of thing. There, We tell them some dreamings and so forth. But one day we sort of realised um, is, is that we're doing this all in English. You know, we weren't doing it in language. You know, we were missing the stories. We were missing the true meanings of everything which we were saying. So where I come from in Australia, it's a place called Newcastle. Uh, the country there is Awabakal. Um, it is the second oldest town in Australia after Sydney. It is the place where convict settlement, the first uh, convict settlement, actually started in Australia. It was the most hard, I will go so far to say it was, it was probably the most hardest hit um, uh, Aboriginal nation in Australia at that time. It could actually have been the first language to have stopped being spoken. As far as we're aware, we haven't had speakers on land there maybe since the 18. 60s, 1870s. That was when maybe two people could have last been speaking with one another. So it's been a long time where the language hasn't been there. The first Aboriginal mission in Australia was actually formed on our country back in 1824. The first. And uh, thankfully, um, I don't know whether to whether it's says thanks or not, but anyway, the task of a lot of missions was to um, uh, uh, make better people of the wild natives by preaching the gospel. And uh, this missionary fellow, Lancelot Threlkeld from England, um, yeah, it quickly worked out that um, it wouldn't work in English at that time, so he, uh, he set about um, learning the language and he translated the Gospels of Luke and Mark into a Wabakal. And it's those, that language evidence which, is, which form the basis of us uh, uh, getting the language back. Because it was around 2004 where we got a phone call and someone had found a book in Sydney. And that book um, uh, was printed in 1892. And uh, we were told it had our language in it. So my buddy, Aby, um, drives down to Sydney, had $500 in his pocket and he bought the book. Come back in a brown paper bag, still wrapped up in that bag today. But that was the language of the land which we were living on. We found the words. When we were doing our bush tucker talks and our cultural talks, you know, we'd talk, you know, we had a wall there and on it was painted uh, a story and a, the story told of how the kangaroo got its tail. You know, we'd hold up boomerangs and axes and spears and so forth and you know, show the kids these. For the first time, but we could actually talk about how Moani got his tail. We didn't hold up the axe anymore, we held up a mogo. You know, the boomerang, no, nah, no more. Dharma. That's what we started to get back. And that happened just in early 2000 there. We started to speak the words and that's what we're still just doing is starting to speak the words. We got a little bit of government funding, $25,000 to start our language program officially through the federal government there and it was great. 18 months after we started, the federal government commenced a study um, to see of the value that they were getting out of their funding. And, um, and when it come to our day uh, for our program to, to be uh, evaluated, um, uh, the person, uh, the consultant came into our place and we showed him, I don't have it here, unfortunately, but uh, we showed him this water paper, which was about this thick, and it was, a, it was done in Microsoft Excel as a spreadsheet, but we printed it out of 2,400 words which we had found in that book. 2,400 words. And um, we thought we'd done damn good. But um, at the end of the day, that lady left, and uh, three months later we got the final review of the report, 
and the report said basically that um, uh, the recommendation was to defund this organisation because the two Aboriginal men don't use basically academic, don't have academic credibility, training or utilise academic services in their language work. We'd found 2,400 words and we're already, we started to speak it. Nevertheless, we're fighters, as we all are. We didn't take no for an answer. We, we rallied together and we got them to give us one more chance. So if we got to get another $25,000 for that next year. So we were very happy about that. But we knew we had to smarten up. It was... Uh, it sort of lit a fire and today that's still burning but the, what the fire did was is, is it, since that day we're still fighting for credibility for our work still fighting and um, uh, not sure if we're getting there but we're certainly doing something anyway but um what I worked out was, this is for one of the things that the academics have got, is they've got access to technology. You know, they're utilising the computers and they're putting our language into that and they're being able to analyse that and they're being able to do some pretty good things with it. And I thought, okay, let's get hold of some of those tools. I don't need Microsoft Excel, maybe. Let's get something better. And I, I don't know if it was Google was here then or whatever, or whether I Yahooed or... Um, something else but um, I started googling the internet there's that verb and started looking for what was out there that we could use and I come across these things called um, Shoebox, Toolbox Lexic Pro, Kira Kira um, and all these other funny names and I'm like I'm looking I'm going Shoebox? What, is that how the value of our... I'm going to say this, is that I could not believe that they named a program where they're putting our language into it and they're calling it a shoebox. My shoebox at home is full of things that I've lost and I can't find anything in it, sometimes like ladies' handbags. But um, that's, what the, that's what they'd called it. Anyway, I got all these programs down, downloaded and put onto my computer and tried to have a go at using them and I couldn't. I actually left, I've been working with computers since 1982 and I could not understand these programs. They're putting our language into it and I couldn't get access to these to be able to use. So it was like, okay, um, I'll, my, I had to resort to making my own program. And uh, uh, what happened was, is, is, uh, if, over the next 12 months there, I was... For, um, fortunate enough to get an opportunity to come to go to a conference, um, much, much smaller than this, but nevertheless, it was full of Aboriginal people, our peers, and I was able to present to them what I was doing. And this was the first time I'd gotten up and stood up in front of these group of people before. It was back maybe 04, 05 or something, and um, very shy I was, and um, showed them this database where we had been putting our language in. And at the end, any questions? No. Nope. Okay, put the lid down and went and sat down nice and quietly. Oh, that didn't go down too good. At lunchtime, but everyone kept on coming up to me one by one. Darren, can we get that? And I'm like, I, I don't know. We don't, I'd only just made it for our language for the Iwabako language, that was it. And they said, well, can we get it? We want to put our language into that too. I was, oh, okay. So a light turned on. Wow. You know, there isn't. You know, I was just living in my own little sheltered world there in, in Newcastle area. And um, so, okay, plan in place. We started to change it a bit. And... and um, uh, uh, things started to happen. I'll move on and I'll um, like to show you what's happened where we're at today. So back then we were told defund, 
These people don't know what they're doing. Two Aboriginal men cannot revive a language. Today, first off with developers of the Miramar software, today we actually host the Pulimar National Language and Technology Forum in Australia. We develop the national language website called Our Languages. We couldn't find any other English words to name it other than that because these are our languages. Um, I sit on now both regional, state and national language committees. Um, I'm a foundation member and director of the Eastern States Aboriginal Language Advisory Group. I'm a foundation member and steering committee member of the International Consortium for Training in Language Documentation and Conservation. And uh, I've just recently been appointed to the Colang Infield Institute Committee. Um, some people are familiar with the infield or Colang activity which happens in America. I was fortunate to um, uh, deliver training to that a couple of years ago in Eugene and, um, and now sit on that committee which is, I've, it's only just happened and I'm one of the few international people on that. So um, uh, I think we've done okay. Yeah, Aboriginal people can do something. Yeah, we can make a difference, it seems. The conference, I'll just tell you a little quick story about the conference. I went to one in Adelaide back about 2006, I think it was, to a, to a national um, Aboriginal uh, language conference back then. It's more linguistic based and it was held in a university. And um, we were there, a few of us went down to it and so forth and... Um, uh, uh, it was multi-leveled. We wanted to have a table to put our stuff on. I wanted to show people Miramar and, and that there and uh, put our books there and so forth. They gave us a room down in the basement. That's where all the Aboriginal people, all the community people were all put in that room. The, the academics had the tables just out the, out the front doors and we were the minority. No one's like, like I said, this is, these are our languages. You know, this is our business. So I come up with the idea, we're going to have our own conference. And uh, um, since then it, is, it has grown and grown and grown to become our national language conference and we we're very fortunate to have had um, uh, Jeremy, who you met yesterday, who you've seen yesterday, you probably all know Jeremy, make sure everyone knows him, wins, bluffs his way into Will and Tannel contests and all that stuff. I don't know how he does that, but... Um, American Idols, but um, uh, and Jordan came came to our conference last year. So we've made a difference. We've gone from just being a very small language centre to now one of the largest Aboriginal language centres in Australia. So take something, okay? Light the fire, keep stoking it, okay? Um. So what is Miramar? Just a couple of years ago, in the Northern Territory, which is the top part of Australia in Arnhem Land, um, an archaeologist guy was walking through the bush, come across the cave, and this is in your newspapers too. It's actually big headlines in America, it was. Um, he found a rock. He looked, picked it up, looked at it, and... The rock is now, I'm going to put the glove on, as I should, help you see it a bit better. The rock was about that big. And he's looked at it and he's found evidence of you know, human manufacture of that rock and so forth. And what he concluded was, is that it was part of an axe. A broken axe. Mogo axe. Stone axe. Is that my accent? A rhyme then, axe, accent. Um, um, it, everything stopped. They found a rock. The place was locked down. Helicopters started bringing in um, other archaeologists from around the world. People come in everywhere. They bought it off the place. You know the scene? I can tell you, 
that rock, that axe was broken. It wasn't wanted anymore. It was just tossed away. We didn't care about it. Just go and make a new one. But that's how much they valued that rock. Now, I look at that and you know, they're looking at it, they're, they're measuring, they're drawing all these detailed aspects of it, you know, pencil stuff, they're measuring it to the, oh, I can't use, say the word millimetre here, can I? I'm not, is that okay? Um, all of those type of things, the colour, where it's been tucked, all this stuff, they're, and then they're digging everywhere else. You know how much money they spent on that little rock that was thrown away just to, to, to analyse all of that? We spent 25... Now, the value of that rock, that's Moga. Um, that edge is used for you know, uh, cutting the skin off the kangaroo, Moani. That skin is then used for warmth. Um, the meat of course, is consumed. That's what we get out of that. But that's what we get out of that word. We've, we found 2,400 rocks. Remember I said, mentioned earlier that number? For $25,000. They spent, I don't know, it might have been $2.5 million on what, that one little rock when they were investigating it. The value of our, of, our, of our words is far, far undervalued. We need to treat every single word like that rock. And that's what Miramar is about. It's treating every single word as precious. Okay? That's what I just wanted to do before I show you Miramar. Miramar in our language means saved. We couldn't find any other word more appropriate to name this program. So, I'll, um, first off, I'd just like to um, show you who is using Miramar. Bit hardy because I'm trying to crank my head around the corner here to see. Is that like a video thing? Yeah. So this is where Miramar is being used. Now, each one of those dots represents Miramar somewhere in Australia. You can see some there throughout Asia, in India, I think that's that place. Kenya, oh yeah, here's your way. So I've got from up the top in Alaska, down through Canada, North America, I'm hanging for a conference to be held down that way somewhere. And also in South America. Imagine if that lady got away with telling us to, you know, that we shouldn't be doing our stuff, defund that mob. And here we are back home. That's our language centre in Newcastle. We've got it all painted up with Aboriginal art and everything now. We've got kangaroos jump around the place and all sorts of stuff there. Do you believe that? I'm going to just... Um, what I'd like to do now is show you mirror masks. I'm just going to try and quickly get the screens equaling one another here. Cool. Okay, so um, Miramar is a program which I'd like to show you now. Um, I don't want it to scare you off with some, you know, with, it's a freaky looking thing because I'm hopefully um, within 
what, 15 minutes, I'll all have you as, as experts of Miramar here. Being able to understand it, not a problem at all. Miramar itself runs in Windows. It doesn't run on a Macintosh at all. Even though I'm using a, 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 an Apple Mac here, um, uh, I, I have Windows on the computer as well there. So here's Miramar. Um, uh, the young ancestors yesterday mentioned it a couple of times. Um, you know, through YLI, they have been uh, using it themselves for quite a while now. Um, so it's a tool which you, know, you can choose to, if you wish to use it or how you use it and so forth. There's all sorts of different ways in that. But the first thing, how this program differs from any other language program out there in the world, and I'm going to say this, in the world, is as that we do everything we possibly can to help you um, adhere to community protocols, to ownership of language. All the work which you do within Miramar sits on your computer. It doesn't sit on the internet at all. So you have full control, access and security with it there. Even sitting on this computer, as you can see, I've got to have a username and a password to get in. Okay? I may be only permitted to go to particular areas within Miramar. The linguist who comes in every now and, get, now and then at our language centre to do work on Miramar, we can actually say where they can and can't go in Miramar. Okay? Uh, men's business, women's business, ceremonial, sacred language. Miramar can separate all those from being able to hear to community protocols. Okay? Shoebox don't do that. It just chucks all the language in that one thing and that's it. It's free for all. I don't like that. So I'm going to log in here, uh, type in my name, my secret password, okay? Um, so here's Miramar. There's three areas. Um, uh, there's the view area, the learn and the tools. Um, we try and use plain English wherever we can. Uh, we try not to be technical at all. What we're actually able to do with Miramar is as if you actually had the word for view or look or something else there in your language, you can actually change that. So that appears there. Okay? You can change the word for learn to your language word if you wish. You can change the word for tools and we're, and we're introducing that ability throughout Miramar itself there. So you can actually localise the language to your own. I'm going to go into the, um, into the we just call it the editor area. And um, normally I'm not this far away from the screen and I stand down in front and I jump around and I can actually point, I can't jump up that high. So I'm going to try and stand up here and use the mouse as best as I can. We've got um, some areas here, which I'm just going to describe before I then show you some words, OK? Um, this area here, is that arrow able to be seen by yourselves? Yep. That's the language area. Just simply that there. Here's the translation language area here, and in this instance it's English. We've got a multimedia area here for stuff. Then we've got this area over here which is, I just aptly call it more stuff. I'll just click on some of these. There's some tabs here. So there's lots of stuff there, uh, a heap more stuff there and some other stuff there. You can see I try and keep it simple. Okay, you call it, you label it. Um, I ain't a linguist, I ain't an academic, I'm far from all of those things, okay? And each day I'll probably use a different word to describe that. Up we've got our, up the top here, we've got our go-to area. I like that, it's got a bit of a ring to it. Then we've got our info area and I've got a little notepad down here. Do you have like sticky notes? We invented those at home, I don't know if you've got them over this way like little notepads, you stick them all over your screen. Have they come to America yet? 
I don't, have they? Yeah, really? Okay, we've got a little sticky notepad on the here because what ended up happening was this is my staff at work who use Miramar, they ended up, I'd go to their computer and it's got, it's like a little pattern of these sticky notes hanging all the way around here and it's like, what is going on? And they've got all their language notes on there, their word notes. And I'm thinking, if you open up that window, they're gone. Yeah, the cleaner comes in, they're gone. So we introduce sticky notes into Miramar. So over on the left-hand side, you can write whatever you like and it'll stay there. So all of a sudden the sticky notes went, sort of. Four weeks later, all the sticky notes are all back, but anyway. So um, what I'd like to do is just give you a, a quick look of what Miramar is, is here. And um, um, I'm going to... I said a word earlier called Moani. Would anyone like to have a go at spelling that? Give me a hand. Have a go at spelling Moani. Uh, M. No, go say O. Oh, 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 oh. See what's happening? Say W. Oh, look, there we go. I didn't, but see how I only got so far? Because I don't know how to, I don't know how to spell it all the time. Yeah, I'm, use, I'm having to use someone else's writing system, Roman symbols, to represent our unique sounds in 2012. What did you see? Well, what, how do you know that? Did you did you read it? How did you saw it? Hey, we're using our other sense. We we don't want. We're not worried about the Roman character stuff. Our language back home, you know, we never had a writing system. Our languages are oral, so we want to use that. So straight away, you've seen kangaroo, Australia's most deadliest animal. I see the uh, on the news or something, whatever the other. I don't know where I've seen it. A kangaroo running around the streets of America somewhere. Someone had it as a pet. I'm just like, what? Get out of it. But anyway, I don't know if they've worked out, but those things can jump. So no matter how big the fence is, <laughs> you just don't even worry. Okay, kangaroo, Moani. There's an image. There's a second image. Audio. Moane, Moane, kangaroo, Moane. This is Moani. Here I'm about to tell you a story about how Moani got his tail. Moani, where I tell where Billy in. So I'm going to add an audio to that now. Okay, I'm going to give it a quick go. So I've just opened up Audacity on the computer here. Uh, Moani. Oh no, my audio's not working. It's not plugged into the mic. The technological demon has grabbed my computer. I won't go there at the moment then. I won't even try and do that. But as you can see, what we can actually do is, is within Miramar, it's actually storing multiple images. You know, we can store um, multiple audio. We can have the single word pronounced. We can have um, a sentence spoken. Uh, we can have a story told. What we're doing is we're gathering all evidence about that language word. We're using multimedia to be able to do that as well. What else can I see up here? Is, is that on the, le on the right hand side over here, if that mouse is showing okay, we found that word in a book from 1834. We found that word on page 88 of that book. Down here there's a link. I'm going to click on that link. Here's the book. I'm going to go to page 88. See if
77. Whoa, just up. Moani, over here. There it is there. I've got my whole language centre sat here in the Hard Rock Hotel, Casino, Albuquerque. It's all here. My whole language centre. Everything is here. I'm going to go to um, Butterfly. I just quickly typed it in. You can see I only had to do a couple of letters there. There's an image. Here's a video. Bayang Bayang. We've got that. I actually took that video on a butterfly farm. It was unreal. Loved it. But what we've got here is, this is something which I'll just talk about for a sec. You can see up in the right hand, here is where, how it was originally spelled back in 1834 on the couple of pages previous and it was recorded as a butterfly. But this is where we get lost in translation, I think. Now, I'm, I'm sure you probably can understand this as well. Is, is that I know bayang bayang doesn't mean butterfly. It's what was used back then to represent that. But bayang bayang actually means one who flutters. But Western white fella look at, nah, it's butterfly. Now down the bottom here, I've got all sorts of things here. You can see that the visibility of that word is unrestricted. I can tag the words questionable, sacred, sexual, restricted. I can put a time, a time point to that word, whether it's traditional, modern, you know, post-contact, what, did it come from somewhere else? Um, we can have some notes over the end here. We can tag it, categorise it. Uh, fancy thing, I don't know, semantic domains and all that type of stuff, but I just yeah, categorise it there. It's been categorised under wildlife as an insect. An absolutive now, I've got no idea what that absolutive means, but that's why we're just told to put there anyway. Now, you can see that on the left hand side here, there's an info area. And that particular area there has, a, it, it, it's actually telling us who entered that word. At the moment, this was unknown because this word was actually entered before this feature came in. But I can look at this here and that was last edited by Jackie on the 31st of August 2011 at 2.21pm in the afternoon. You know, something could have happened and we need to go back to, hey Jackie, what happened? What was the go? What did you change? And so forth. We, don't, we only log so much information at the moment there but we need to... Um, you know, a lot of the times it's used for historical reasons. We're digitising our language here for the first time. It's, got, it's, it's leaving the old book which could perish at any moment, could be lost in a flood or fire or whatever. We're digitising it for the first time now. You know, we're hoping that we're setting the foundation for you know, a true revival of this language for 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the track. So... Just as we have looked at the people in the past who, who, we, who we admire for their hard work, you know, we're also recognising for the people today who are doing this part as well. Everyone has a part to play and we acknowledge that. That's the way I tend to like to look at that there. But um, I'm just going to go into the background area here and I'm going to show you that in our sources area, this is where... This is where we actually store where we found the language. Unfortunately, we never had speakers at a time where equipment could have been used to record them as well. So we have no sound recordings. We've, we have had an amazingly difficult challenge in being able to pronounce the words. We've, first off, we had no recordings. Secondly, we definitely did not have any speakers. 
So the challenges which have been put in front of us have been some of the, the hardest to overcome. But um, in here, you can see the, when you see the little blue thing down the bottom there, these are all sources which have been digitised and they're all here available. You can, some which are. They could be audio files, they could be video, they could be speakers if that's what you would have there. They don't have to be a document. It could be a napkin where you were at the bar and someone gave you a word and you quickly wrote it down. You digitise it, put it there, get a photograph of it, preserve it. That napkin is more valuable to me than that. Because that word has knowledge within it. There's a book here which I want to show you. 18 months ago, a fellow walked into our place. White fellow walked in. I know I'm fair skinned white fellow too, but that's my mum's side and my dad's side. That's another story for another day. Um, come in with a plastic shopping bag and he had this book underneath his arm and he said, I was suggested to come and see you. He said, I've got something you might be interested in. Oh, okay. Oh, well, here we go again. He comes in, sits down at the table there and he undoes it and this is what he opened up. This is just 18 months ago. We've put that little writing on the front there but I'm just going to open up to the next page. A few words in Wiradjuri dialect and as you can see there by the look of the... There's a lot of age in this book. We don't know who the author is. We do know that it left Australia, went to England, hung around over there for a while, then come back to Australia... God knows where it was passed around to and eventually ended up in a plastic bag and brought into our place about 18 months ago. Um, the book is split into two, Wiradjuri dialect at the beginning and then a Wabakal dialect at the end. Within 18 months, we found over 60 new words. I'm going to go back to that and the value that we put on each one of those words um, very good value for money we are because we don't fly in helicopters and mark off the place and all sorts of stuff there okay but we are finding these every single one of them was as valuable as that 60 new words is just it's amazing we, we only just recently found the word for sister You know how hard it is not being able to, well, for some it can be easy not having to speak to your sister, but how hard it is for others to not be able to speak to your sister, you know, to call them, to acknowledge them. You know, that's, that's the type of loss which we've had, the type of challenge which we've had of finding words. But this is in Miramar, okay? All of this stuff is sat here. This is just crazy. Um, how long do I have? Oh. Okay, I've only got 10 minutes, but I hope that's given you a quick insight of into Miramar. This is just one screen. Um, we thought we were going to be... Look, we want to make them feel good. So we actually gave the linguists their own little screen to go to. Um, do you notice anything about that screen? Uh, to me it's boring. The pictures went. The audio went. The video went. Okay, it's hidden at the back there. But anyway, they're happy with that. They love that area. So we would, it was a nice feel-good thing that we did for them. Keeping their good books. But we have also, um, uh, there's a learner area where you can go into here our, our database sits on our server for those technical people. In it. We have a network back at our language centre. It sits on our network there and uh, any one of our workstations can actually log into Miramar and access all the central information there. And um, we can also have a computer out in the community area where anyone in the public can walk in. Back at the beginning where it said username and password, they type in learner and learner 
and they only get access to this screen here, only this screen, uh, where they will... Antan, Antan... Okay, a learning area there. George. It's a bit bit more of an advanced area because it has all this other stuff down the bottom here as well. But uh, Miramar itself, like I said, has got a lot of things in it. I've never had the opportunity to be able to, um, except for Eugene, but to be able to have, um, I should say I've had very, very few opportunities to be able to give people a look at it in person in, in North America here and um, it's great to be able to have this opportunity today. Um, there is a lot that Miramar can do. Um, not, be, not doing no sales pitch or what anything, but Miramar... We give, okay? If you're a, I'll use the term, um, Indigenous person, Native, um, Aboriginal, um, uh, we will give you Miramar. You apply online for a licence to get it because we like to put dots on Google Earth. We need to know where you are, okay? Um, uh, But um, we can help you if you feel that this could be part of your toolkit, okay? I, I, I do have enough time, but I want to show you some other exciting things in a moment. Um, normally, from Miramar, okay, I can sit here and put things into it, enter things in. We've got over 7,000 rocks in Miramar, pieces of language evidence have been entered into Miramar there. If I wanted to, in three minutes, I can have all of that language sat in Microsoft Word in, with pictures in colour ready to send to the printer. Okay? We use actually a program called Lexic Pro to do that. Then Miramar talks to it. There's no way in the world we're going to go and invent a dictionary making program when someone else has done it. Okay? But Miramar talks to it. So what I'm saying to you is, is that whatever you put in the Miramar, you can get out. And that's very, very important. Try and do that in shoebox and toolbox and it's very, very difficult. If, a, if any academic has done work on your language and attempted to hand that back, that work to you, okay, in a digital format, example, a, a, a marked up file from shoebox or toolbox there, oh, heaven help you, start again, I'm sorry. Because it's very, you know, it's not in a user friendly format. Um, just with my short time here, what I also wanted to... So I'm talking about what you put in and so forth. So first and foremost, what Miramar is, is a place where you can gather all evidence of your language, all evidence of your knowledge. Miramar can be used to do that. Okay? First and foremost, that's what it does. And it does that... I will be so bold to say to world leading standards in archiving of language, in conservation of language. Okay? Behind the scenes, the things that Miramar does, who's got a messy computer? I'll put my hand up. Okay? You, 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 you've done something, you've saved it at the computer. Where is it? Where's it gone? I can't find it. Yeah? Miramar takes care of all of that for you and make sure it's all accessible, okay? It's, it's the only computer program tool which we have up our sleeve in this world still today, I think in 2012, which is aimed at us, okay? I'm s- grouping us all together here. It's made by us for us. We are not-for-profit Aboriginal Language Centre, not just reviving our language, wanting to speak it once again, so we can connect with country, so we can connect with our people and bring our culture back. It's made by us for us. Okay? This is, this is ground root level stuff. So I'm hoping that if you, if you find a bit of use maybe to obtain, that you get to know where it's coming from, okay? So, um, but... Some of the other things that I'd like to... I'll move on from that bit, which I'd like to show you. Um, this is our website up there. 
miramar.org.au where you can go and have a sticky bee. There's about 30 videos on here of how you use Miramar on our YouTube channel. What I want to show you is, um, this is something very exciting. This is like world exclusive, okay? No one in Australia has seen this outside of about five people. Can we turn that camera off now? <laughs> I'm getting my iPad out here, okay? all works out okay, another technology thing. Okay, so here's my iPad. Um, within a couple of clicks within Miramar, Miramar can export all your language out of Miramar, have it sitting on the desktop, okay, packaged, ready. Flick it to us, okay, and this is my little language area, Recently, we were asked by the Wadarong language community, which is at the bottom of Australia there, to help them make an iPad app. They wanted to share their language out and make it available there. And um, so they commenced putting about 400 words into Miramar. And this, oh, what's happened? And this is what they've. This is what Miramar has done for them. We've now developed. Um, we thought very hard about this. And we called it I Miramar. What do you think of that? <laughs> anyway, here is the Wadarong language app, and um, uh, I will acknowledge that I've been given permission to be able to show you this. So the camera part is okay. The Wadarong elders and language holders have, ha have given me permission to show you here today. And this is what it is. So I can click up the left-hand corner there. I can pull down here a list of all of the, uh, the language categories which they've done in Miramar. I showed you that little area over the corner there somewhere and you were categorising the words. Um, so here... I'll go in, oh, I want one where there's lots. So body, uh, body parts, and I'll press on ankle. Bam. Can it, did you hear that okay? Bam. Don't have, is, you, you can at least hearing that there's volume now. What I can do is, is, is I can tap the screen and I can make it look like a flashcard. So the, the characters have now gone, so I can go to the, the next word they are and I can ask the kids to, you know, what's the word for, what do you think that will be? Back? Weary. 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 And I can tap the screen and there's the word come back. So I've got my little flashcard learning here on the iPad for the kids to be able to learn. I can quickly go to, uh, if I wanted to, I can, um, uh, I'll go to birds and I'll press water on. So I've now changed it. It's now language to English. Here now. Here now. I can turn it sideways. Well, oh, turn it sideways and I lose my connection. There we go. Here now. I just I'm just flicking from screen to screen there. Calibre. Full screen. Caro. Kawir. Now, what I didn't know was is is that unbeknownst to me is is that um just, I left last Friday, left Friday 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Finally, I arrived here at Friday 6 a.m. Go back in time a bit. Um, uh, but when I'd left, my staff there had gone and done an export of the Yawabakal language and sent it off to um, Oliver, who's our tech guy who does this here, and they've done this. 
they just produced this demo, one for me just to show you. Okay, I'd left just Friday. What's today? I've got no idea of days. Tuesday? Okay, not even, a, you know, just a couple of days later and they've gone and put our language here in this for us to be able to show you here. Uh, Moani, where's Moani? Surely Moani's got to be in here. There he is. Is that picture familiar from the Miramar? Oh, the audio is not playing there at the moment. I'm not sure if I've lost something up there. But how cool is that? They surprised me. You know, within a couple of days, they had our language in an app. The only thing is it's not up on the app, iTunes app store to be able to get it from there because Apple take three weeks or something or whatever at the moment. But how cool is that? That's what Miramar is now evolving into. So that not only having, um, utilising... Yeah, uh, um, yeah, standards in being able to archive and, and, and value our language like never before there, be able to gather it all in one place and all aspects of it, not just the written part but the audio, the video, the images. Um, yeah, the video is, is, is actually the most important part of our language, the, port, the most important part of our gathering because that's when we get the facial expressions, that's when we get the hand gestures, where we get the mouth and the tongue and, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the single most important language which we lost at home was our sign language. We may be able to start to get some of that back, naturally, just like what I'm doing here now. I'm using sign, my expression in my talking to you now. The video is helping us gather that and Miramar can save all of that. But we're making sure that what we put in, we can get out. So I was very... Um, very, uh, very excited to be able to tell um, Jeremy, Jordan and Marissa yesterday that their work that they've been doing in, um, on the Tewa language in Miramar, within a couple of clicks and flick it off to us, we could have possibly a Tewa language app if they got, the, of course, their proper approval and so forth. They may choose a, a, a select group of maybe, say, 20 words that could be... Uh, learnt by all but that's what they've already been done they've already done the hard work all they've got to do is the click click and the flick and they're done we do that other little bit how cool is that um, I think that's my time there were lots of other things um, but I was, I was actually going to get the recorder up here and get a volunteer and do some recording and show you how easy it is to put it into Miramar and that but um, just like everything, we always run out of time and so forth. Um, but I will just um, quickly just flick over here. Like I said, I've come all this way, so give me a minute extra, please. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, Here is our website. Uh, you can always come there and have a sticky beat. Does, is that word translated? What does that mean? Have a look. Sticky beat. Not st sticky note, but sti um, have a look. You can always go and have a browse at our website, see what we're about ourselves as well. Um, there is our, our language website. These are our languages. This is our business. This is our National Aboriginal Language website. We actually put up a lot of your news items on here. We've got a, a large international area where we, uh, where we place your stories on here as well. Um, but you can, you can see about all the programs. We are very, very similar in, in situation and I think we can work very closely together and I'm sure that you know, you've, you know, over the years you may have had other people other than myself, hopefully, um, uh, come and talk to you. Um, uh, I know the, the Maoris are pretty good at running around the place, saying that they're pretty cool, but we think we're pretty cool as well. This is our Pulimar National Language Conference 
Okay. Um, uh, the, the last one, uh, we had Peter Brand from First Voices, um, uh, Candice Gala from um, University of Hawaii in Hilo come, uh, uh, Jordan and Jeremy, um, Laura Jagels, uh, Rachel Nez and so forth um, uh, come to our conference there. We're international. The invitation is open. And you can see that to the this two important words there, language and technology. It's, it's the thing which we have up our sleeve at home. It's basically the only tool that we have up at our, up our, our home today which can help us stop the loss. We're in dire straits in capturing language evidence right now and technology is basically the only tool which we have. I want to have an army of people with video cameras, send them around the country. Unfortunately, I can't do that. But um, There's the CTLDC and uh, I don't know if I'll let you have a look at this, but this is something which we're using now to connect our language with our culture in an in a online environment, this thing called Mukatu. And uh, it's actually developed by a, um, a lady from America here in conjunction with community people back home. Um, I shall stop there because I want to keep going. Um, um, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for your attention and um, for staying back because usually we're doing the bolt in the early in the afternoon to get home and so forth from conferences and um, I'm really appreciative that, um, that people have stayed and, um, and I'm not sure if, um, if, if I've been able to show you something new and um, I hope that I have and, and that you've been able to at least tame something from this short moment here. And um, so thank you very much for that and, and I'd like to um, very much thank Ine, um, uh, Gerald and ILI for um, giving me an invitation to come here and, and, uh, and, and share a small bit of our story and experience and what we're doing um, with yourselves here. So I very much feel honoured to have that opportunity to be able to do that. So thank you.